Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mosh Talks with me, Bees, here every single Tuesday on NotFest.com, on the NotFest YouTube channel. And for the very first time, we are now a podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts, over the course of the next couple of days, we're going to be rolling this out. Mosh Talks is going to be available as a podcast. So good news. Who is on this week's show, though? I hear you ask. Well, You've probably seen the poster for it, but if not, Jacoby Shaddix is going to be here fresh from this weekend's InFest in studio event. I am going to be talking to him about the ins, the outs, everything in between about 20 years of their InFest albums. Going to be a good time. Jesse Leach is going to be here. Jesse featured on a brand new track with Rob Flynn from Machine Head. He was here last week saying that you're going to hear new music from Machine Head really soon. A couple of days later, he dropped two songs, one of which includes Jesse Leach. So he's going to be here. We also talk about Kill Switch Engage and Times of Grace and a bunch of other cool stuff. I'm really excited about our third guest, Mick Gordon. You might not know that name, but you may well have heard his work because he is the guy that soundtracks Doom and Doom Eternal. He is the guy responsible for all that gnarly industrial music playing while you're chainsawing that floating thing with one eye. Yes, Mick Gordon is going to be here. Really cool to talk to him. Johannes Eckerstrom from Avatar is going to be here. We talk about their new record a bunch and their image and what they've had going on with their latest videos. And last but certainly not least, because he's got a lot to say, Riley Gale from Power Trip is here. We get finally some news about new power trip there's a bunch of um some serious serious words about what's going on in the world at the moment and we discuss their new live album recorded in seattle that is all coming up on this week's mosh talks with me bees so first guest um i'm quite lucky i saw papa roach's first ever uk show as they were blowing up, as Last Resort was happening, as the whole infesting was happening. It was a magical time. Um, I know that not everyone shares my personal obsession with all things new metal. Maybe I was the right age or whatnot. But I tell you, man, every time I hear infest it really really gives me a warm glow about falling in love with heavy music and falling in love with new bands at the time uh, i'd never heard of this band and then bam last resort happened and the rest is history but um infest is an album that means a lot to me i'm sure it means a lot to you out there uh and here is the irrepressible jacoby shaddix talking about all things infest we get into unreleased side projects we get into should probably just roll the interview right here i am me bees jacoby shaddix from papa roach here on mosh talks my day is always better when it's filled with a little jacoby shaddix in it man how are you are you keeping the posse going in these these times like uh, you're one of the most positive people i know so forgive me if i'm going jacoby give me something mate <laughs> <laughs> well, man, uh, I'll be straight with you, dude. It's uh, it's been really good being home. To be completely honest, you know, we've been going for years. We dropped our first record in two thousand, and we've just been trugging along. And it took a pandemic, I guess, to to stop us. And uh, you know, I can't I can't say that it's been terrible. It's been pretty, it's been pretty damn good. You know, just to be yes. around my family and stuff. You know. Other than the obvious, like being people around, have you picked up any weird hobbies or something that's really categorized this time? Um, you know, for me, I'm just like odd hobbies. No, nah, man, I'm like uh, my wife's just got me doing a bunch of stuff around the house that I've been avoiding for like 20 years of touring. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just going to be real with you on that, man. It's uh... <laughs> right. Well, on the subject of 20 years of touring, man, uh, this year is celebrating 20 years of Infest. And, you know, like, when I hear 20 years, at, at first, there it is, the record, man. Like, I'm, I'm buzzing to do this chat with you, Jacoby. Yeah. Because on the one side, I think it doesn't feel like 20 years. And on the other side, like, there's all of these stories that exist. Yeah. I've got my own. I'll, I'll save it to the end. But like, 
But like if it, the, the biggest thing that's really stood out for me isn't just the love for the record and the songs and the rest of it. There's been such an outpouring of stories from people that yeah. involve Infest. Like, how has that been for the last while you've been celebrating Infest? Yeah, it's it's actually been really cool, man, to see like in the pre-roll thing part of the show. Um, I was sitting with my family yesterday on the couch just chilling watching it and all these people were popping up and I didn't know that these people did these videos the management went out and like sussed out all these like you know tell us a story about him fast or how you heard about it you know and it was cool I saw like Cy from Don Broco popped up there and was talking about how we learned how we learned the last resort riff and like rolled up in school and just straight ripped it in front of all of his friends and it like <laughs> it, it was just like a moment for him you know and so to be able to like Witness those. Even Caleb from Beartooth gave us a shout out, you know, like some of these cats, these younger guys that are coming up that I just I'm a big fan of. It's just so cool to see how our music had inspired them. Even uh, Aaron from Of Mice and Men, you know, it's like he's from Vacaville, where I'm from. And uh, for him to kind of tell that story about, you know, him coming to the teen center and watching us play shows as a young kid and how it lit a fire underneath his ass like. It just, I, I look back on that and I just, I'm like, wow, like this, this is real. This really, this 20 years, this is real. The impact of this record is real. Um, the impact of our, 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 our band in music in the 2000s was massive. And uh, to be able to reflect upon that and just hear the stories of people's, you know, passion for our music. It's like, it just, it blows me away, man. It puts me in like, I'm, gr I'm grateful, very grateful. Very great. So, so uh, the the celebration itself this Saturday that you recorded the VOD thing. What was the significance to it being in that rehearsal room in Sacramento? Is there is there any kind of like added thing that comes with the VOD? Oh yeah, man. So uh, when we when we were trying to figure out a place to go do this, we actually owned a studio downtown Sacramento, and we sold it uh, two years ago to this guy, and he put a bunch of money into it, man. He like. He made it everything we ever wanted it to be. And I came back about a year ago and checked it out. And he's like, hey, man, if you ever want to come and, you know, throw down tracks or record here or do whatever, like, just hit me up. And uh, we were coming up with the idea for this. And I called him up. I'm like, yo, dude, can we roll down to the studio and, like, see if we can come shoot this thing there? Because we had uh, written and recorded our album, The Connection, there. Um, I had uh, recorded the demos for um, a side project I was going to do back in the day called Fight the Sky. I produced some demos for uh this band called die trying that we um eventually got, helped get a record deal for um we recorded uh the collaboration between papa roach and the black eyed peas um called anxiety at this studio and so there was just all this history of us being in this space plus it's literally right next door to the rehearsal spot uh that the deftones came up in and oh. it, was, it, was this, it was this hub in sacramento of creativity and music and and bands and you know everybody coming together right there and it just seemed really fitting to uh celebrate those years of 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 our band at that spot and after we did that we we're like oh man i can't wait to come here and cuts you know cut tracks do vocals you know for some new stuff and so it's really really nice to be in that room and you know just feel the vibes and it just felt like hey we're home you know mm. And if you want to check out the performance, check in the description below. I'm going to leave the link there for if you want to check out the full performance. But let's do this, man. Full in fest chat. Um, some of this you'll have answered a million times. Some of it, I think, is quite unique through looking at things through the prism of 2020. But first things first, we were introduced to you as Kobe Dick. Where did that come from? Kobe Dick, Mr. Dick, if you're nasty, Dr. Dick, if you're sick. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we had a wh big white van back in the day, and it was a 15-passenger van, and my wife actually signed um, the paperwork for it because none of us had good credit in the band. Kelly was the only one with credit. So she graciously, uh, against her best judgment at the time, she was like, I don't know if I should be doing this. She went and signed the paperwork for us. We had this big old white van, and we started touring in that, and the band was paying the bills, right? But uh, my wife Kelly at the time, Kelly, sorry, my wife Kelly was, uh, you know, the, the signer on it. So thank you, babe. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, you know, so grateful for that. Um, but this big old white van and, I, you know, people call me Kobe, you know, because it's short for Jacoby. And it mm -hmm. just was easy, 
you know, and then our manager was like, this guy, Gary Avila at the time, he's like, man, you should just change your name to Kobe Dick, dude, because we had the fan, we called it Moby Dick, right? And uh, it just seemed to fit, just rhymed, and, you know, I was all about that rhyme back in the day, and uh, it just stuck, it just stuck, and it, it was just that deal. Now it's funny, because I got a little, my youngest son, um, Brixton, you know, he lo he loves Papa Roach, he listens to the music, you know, and he's like, Dad, why, why, why is your name Kobe Dick? That's not your name. And I'm like, well, you know, back in the day, that was like my AKA son. And I had to like <laughs> tell him what an AKA is, you know? Yeah. And he's all, well, can I be Brick Dick? And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I guess if you have to. You know, that would kind of be a good hotel check-in name. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. funny story. So, so you mentioned a van, like, not enough people. I think because you just kind of it, like it was like last resort, and here's Papa Roach. I don't think people quite realise the amount of hustling that you did, particularly in that van where you oh, yeah. used to you used to drive to uh, concert venues when shows were happening, just to give out your CDs and oh, things yeah. like that. Like there was a lot of grind pre Infest, right? Most definitely, man. And we took a, we took a page from the, the hip hop book, you know, from the East Coast hip hop book with they'd roll out with the boom box and slang their stuff on the street. And I just, I respected that hustler. I was a hard worker. Um, I grew up with, uh, you know, the value of if you've put the work in, you'll see the result type of mentality. And we would roll up on Deftones concerts or corn concerts, Limp Biscuit concerts with a boom box on our shoulders. Right. And we're, we're rolling. I'm playing the tracks out the, out the boom box. And I'm like, what the fuck Papa Roach five bucks. Uh, what the fuck papa roach five bucks uh, what the fuck you know and i had this chant and this mantra and people be like who the fuck's this weirdo i'm like yeah what's up he wrote you came to slang you some shit man you want to buy it dude y'all don't know about us but you about to know you know and so i had i was just this i still am i just had that hustle man and uh it's just something that was instilled into us as a, as a young band to like that was our way to cut through the clutter. You know, there was plenty of other bands putting up their flyers and doing the deal, but we felt we had to take it to another level and like be in their face. Mm. And I just, that was, that was our social media. You know what I mean? That was social yeah. media. We were like right in your face, dude. We were slapping high fives and bear hugs and slanging CDs and like talking stories. And, Oh, there'd be a couple of people that knew about our band, you know? So then we go, Oh, what's up, man? You're my people. Like we hand out stickers, you know, like we were just that hustling band and it worked out for us, man. We, uh, we, uh, we, we started to get to see some new fans coming to the shows and we'd sell those old $5 CDs and, and spread the, spread the gospel of Papa Roach, you know? Mm. So when, when you were doing that, you mentioned like, you know, at the time Papa Roach came, like we'd already seen Deftones break and Corn and Biscuit and Incubus. When you were grinding away, when you guys were putting together Infest, did you feel like you had something to contribute to what was going on to rock music at that time that was a bit different? Because Papa Roach have their own signature sound within like the sound that defined that era. Did you feel like you had something to give to this that weren't that was something new? Oh, most definitely, man. We felt like we fit into the fabric right next to any of those bands. You know, uh, we, we were doing shows, Incubus came up to Sacramento and we weren't signed yet. We didn't have a record deal. They opened for us in our hometown, you know, and we were one of those bands that we were making waves in NorCal. We just hadn't really grabbed the attention of the industry. Another group that would come up and open for us, Snot would come up North and play with us, um, Alien Ant Farm, you know, so we, we fit amongst these bands that were already, that already had record deals. We just hadn't like made it over that hump yet. And, uh, you know, as far as stylistically, like we always considered ourselves like, in a sense, we felt like we were like the punk version of new metal in a sense. And uh, lyrically, you know, it was very, very raw. Um, it wasn't, you know, while Limp Biscuit kind of was toting this like a little bit more of a bro vibe, we were mm. more like, we're fucking punk. You know what I mean? And uh, it wasn't necessarily about like our style of music, but it was our attitude and our approach. And we never, we never really fit into the hometown scene. And so we always kind of were the bastard cousin to every scene. And so we were used to not being, you know, accepted right off the bat. We mm. had to prove ourselves. And uh, we found that, you know, over the over the years, man, we've had to prove ourselves over and over and over and over. And uh, 
I just think it's it's our path, man. It's 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 who we are because we constantly evolve. And when you when you talk about the lyrics, right? Because we've known each other for years, right? And you are uh, like I meet everyone in this game, but you are the thing that stands out about you, Jacoby, to me is you're one of the most heart on sleeve people that I've ever met in my entire life. And yeah. so all of your lyrics are pretty personal, but there's something about Infest because it's so raw and because it's so, there's no filter, there's not a lot of metaphor going on. It is yeah. bam, this is what I'm feeling. This is how, like yeah. how it is. Do you recognize the Jacoby who wrote those words? You know, as we were going back and rehearsing all the songs and, and, diving back into to the record in the rehearsals, it was inspiring to be completely honest. It was like, I, I, I feel inspired by what I was saying early on in those records because some of the stuff is just straight fucking timeless. Um, but you know, like a song like Broken Home, I experienced that as a kid and I, I, I hadn't written, written a song about that before in my life and I felt like I had to, I, I needed to like get this off my chest as a young adult and uh, come to find out you know so many other people walk through that same thing or you know between angels and insects where i had this this period of as a as a young adult this sense of this search for enlightenment or some kind of wis wisdom and knowledge you know imparted upon me you know and realizing what my mother had taught me as a kid like you know these materialistic things aren't going to fill the hole inside of you you know i was searching for that you know, songs like Br Blood Brothers about my family, about my crew. Like, it's not always, it's not always blood that makes you, you family. You know what I mean? It's like the people that you keep close to you. That could be your family. And so, these guys in the band, you know, Tobin, Dave, Jerry, they became my family. Um, it was, it was just so important to me. You know, and then songs like Legacy, where it was like, I was starting to learn about, you know, the corruption and and politics and just the uh, just the filth and the greed and the and the dirty side of of uh, of government and politics and I was singing about that and legacy and how does that it just fits the scene right now you know and it really confirms where we're at in 2020 like my mind was in the right place as a young man I really feel mm -hmm. like you know aside of like my issues of, of drinking and stuff like that I really feel like I was I was starting to wake up in a sense and uh, yeah, man, powerful record. It's it's really got me inspired to what am I going to do next? You know, because mm. we're, we're writing and recording as we, you know, as we're going through this quarantine as well. And it's like, how's this first record going to going to really influence what we're doing now? Because it was just it was pretty profound as we went in and rehearsed these tracks. So like, you know, I said to the band, this is what I said. I was like, we played Legacy and we played, we rehearsed it like three times over and then we played Thrown Away. And I was like, man, no wonder some fans like think we're lame now. Like, because listen to, <laughs> listen to the shit we were writing back in the day. Like, it was just so fucking hard and just, uh, just so slamming in your face. And it's like, not that we lost that part of ourselves, but it's like, as I grow as an adult, like, there's these different sides of me that come out, you know? Maybe I'm a little bit more sensitive. Maybe I'm a little bit more loving now. You know, maybe there's a little bit more, like, sweetness coming out of me now. But that's okay, dude. It's like, that's the journey of the music, you know? But it was just like, I had that awakening. It was hilarious. And bam, cracked up. So I so I didn't meet crazy Jacoby. Like we've no, like in the time that we've known each other, like like you've been yeah, I say that as you gird at me. But like um that the album flew so high. Like you ended up on the Infest on your first record, you were third from the top on the main stage at the Reading Festival where I'm from, which is like colossal on one record. So yeah. It, did it become over time easier to look back and when you say that life was crazy at that point in time, is it easier to forgive yourself retrospectively for how nuts it was? Because that's a lot for a young man to be thrown straight away in one hit in no time at all. Yeah, man, I had no training. I had no training for what was about to happen with our band. And, you know, our expectation, I guess, was that you know, we're going to go, we're because we got shot down by all these record companies in the process of trying to get a deal. You know, my, our expectation was, yeah, we'll get in the van. We're going to go tour. We're going to go sell, you know, a couple hundred thousand records, you know, maybe creep up to gold if that's possible. And then we'll just keep building this thing. Whereas 
we dropped the first single and it was a rocket ship ride to the top. And then we're like, oh, fuck. Now it's like, you know, all the hanger honors are coming around and all of a sudden I got a bunch of money. And all of a sudden, every time I, I could snap my finger and then a bottle of vodka would show up, you know, and just the madness, it just began. And I, you know, was, we're out on tour with Slipknot and Lincoln Park and Marilyn Manson and, you know, all these massive bands at the time and it was just like i didn't know how to handle myself dude so i just drank and partied and raged and and just beat myself up through that tour and uh you know i look back we watched some videos the uh day before with the with the kids again and they were like there's this video it says like jacoby shaddix is crazy on youtube <laughs> and uh i watched the video and i was like oh i was beating myself in the head with the microphone and i was like you know bleeding and my kids are looking at me like yeah, like, were you, were you all right, man? I'm like, well, you got to understand, son. Like, I had this, we had this record that really, like, delved into a lot of, like, darker issues. And 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 on that stage, I would I would go to that place and I, I, I would self-harm and I would, you know, just, I was, there was a violence and an anger and, a, and, a, and just a visceral, raw release that would come out every night. And uh, I lived it. And... I look back on it and it, it was it was authentic, man. It was a real moment in my life. And, you know, I just eventually I just realized that I, I can't continue to destroy myself like this or there will be no there will be no me. Like I realized like I was slowly killing myself. And so, you know, I had to pump the brakes. But, you know, I just had this I just had this this anger and this frustration and this rage inside myself that I didn't thank God I had the music to channel it to be completely because mm -hmm. it was just. I don't know what I would have been doing if I, if I didn't have the music. And so, you know, I kind of was trying to explain that to the kids and they understood it. Mm. And it was cathartic as listeners, man. Like yeah. there was a generation of people that felt what you felt and we, yeah. we didn't just feel it. Sorry, mate. Would you, would you? No, I'm listening. All right, cool. Like, so um, not only that, but you, you reached us through, I think a lot of it was down to as well as the music, the videos for the yeah. Infest cycle are so that like there's moments that are properly iconic jacoby like the the oh, yeah. between ages and insects where the roaches come out of your mouth the the, yeah. the feel like that the, you feel it under your skin the broken home video and of course in the round last resort like these are all iconic things um do you think the videos played a big part in the legacy of infest oh most definitely i mean we kicked it off with last resort uh, we worked with this guy, uh, Marco Siega, and he had done a video for POD called the uh, the song was Fundamental Elements of Southtown. And it just had this like hardcore kind of punk connected with your fans vibe. And uh, our label hooked us up with Marcos and, and Marcos, he came from the East Coast music scene and he understood the, I guess, the story of coming up as an independent band, playing in the small clubs, because he did that. And he, he came with this concept of like taking the fans where they don't want to be, which is alone and isolated to the place that they want to be, which is at the rock show, connected with their friends, connecting with this music. And it just, it told our story because we spent so many years in these small clubs and these, you know, backyard parties, like forging these relationships one by one with our fans. And we got to have them all around us, surrounding us, celebrating this moment. And uh, it just, it really like, it stuck like glue that video we had to it was on trl and all these you know video channels we had to eventually go and like take a sledgehammer and destroy the videotape at mtv because they were like <laughs> we gotta retire this video we've played it too much you know and then we dropped uh broken home which we did with marco siega again and we actually uh, were uh, nominated for a grammy for that video and that was like you know we dug deep man we just went straight into well, what does a broken home look like? Like we're bringing this right to the forefront. And it was very cathartic, man. I remember breaking down multiple times, crying on set just because the actors were, you know, it was just, there was this tension between the actors on set and like, it was palpable, palpable, you know what I mean? And, and uh, we just went there and you can see it in the video. Like, cause you know, Tobin came from a broken home. I came from a broken home. Uh, Dave Buckner came from a broken home. He suffered some incredible losses as a young man. And, uh, you know, for, for us to be able to like create this art that reflected the pain, but it also was a way to like put a pin in it. Like we're done, we're moving on from this. You know, and then like you said, between angels and insects, um, there's a dope one take of that video floating around. It's like a low shot 
and uh, it's just got this vibe. But you know, just taking that and like bringing the the, the inside to the outside because the camera like goes into you know, I think it's like Jer Dave's ear and comes out his mouth, and I'm like spewing cockroaches all over the people. It was just like, it was just raw and just rad, and it was all about that energy, you know, that big energy, and 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 people connected with it, and we just fuck man. Was, Every time, like, we just show up on set and they're like, it was just such a giant production, right? Yeah. So much different than today, man. It's like, you can go do all these amazing looking things and it doesn't have to be so massive. It's kind of, it's trippy, yeah. man. As the industry has changed, like the mystery, you know, the wizard behind the curtain, I'm like, look behind the curtain. I'm like, oh, we could do that. Yeah, Fuck. totally. <laughs> <laughs> Jacoby. What's the most underrated song on Infest? Oh, man. The most underrated song on Infest. I would have to say... Damn, that's a tough one. What was it? Ooh. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. And the most underrated song. Uh, oh, man, you got me on this one. Let's look, dude. <laughs> I love it when I stump someone, Jacoby. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd say a track called Revenge on this. Right. One, I feel like it, it was it was an underrated song. I felt like that one really had potential to become a single. Um, it was a. Uh, it just was quirky and different and odd, and and it really put like smashed together all those like kooky elements of the band and not such a from a serious perspective musically you know we go into this bridge that just it reminds me like s sound reminds me of visual and when i when i hear this song we go into the bridge of the song this hip-hop break and it just feels like you entered into like a japanese anime godzilla vibe yeah. and i love the places that music takes me inside my head and just sonically and the the riff it just has that down 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 just oh it just got vibe for days man that and legacy oh legacy and so, so you've you've re-recorded tightrope um yeah. is that uh forgive me if i'm delving into it a bit but it feels that is the most underrated song on the record because it was like we weren't even willing to give it a track on the album we were like we we're gonna put it secret in the back you know yeah yeah, yeah. We underrated it as a band. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you've re-recorded it and put it out there. Like the the new version is available wherever you get your streaming. Yeah. Um, is it as much about the message as it is about the song? Because there's some poignant moments in Tightrope yeah. that seem to unfortunately fit where human history is at at the moment. Yeah, man. Uh, Tightrope lyrically is just. Uh, I was on some shit. I was on some, it's just, it's so poignant as what's going on in the world right now. And we, our, our madness as human beings is brought to the forefront through these, through the internet. And it's really like amplified some of the insanity in us as people. And, and uh, this song really like speaks to the heart, speaks to the p spirit of man, to woman and man. And I feel, you know, this thing, really straight up this could be a single like right now i feel it's it's just that on point you know there's a lyric i speak of madness my heart and soul i cry for people who ain't got control let's take our sanity let's take compassion and be responsible for every action and you know that just fits right now it's like we need to lead with compassion empathy that is that is like we need it more now than ever and especially in America, in the boiling point of the of the racial tension, and our our African American brothers and sisters continually being abused by the system. Um, people got to wake up, man. We got we got we got to value each other and love each other. That's it. That's the only way to peace through this is to take a step back. And I feel like everybody needs to look in the mirror and really, really put themselves on the cooker. You know, the only way we're going to change this world is if we change ourselves individually. We got to start, we got to start internally and then we could help our brothers and sisters out, you know? So 
I think everybody's got a little change and we could do. I, I couldn't yeah, agree. I, I ain't trying to preach, but yeah. Did amen the words to the song and the shoe fits. You're right to have your opinion, Jacoby. Uh, all right, let's take this home then. Last resort, like Papa Roach has an Enter Sandman. It has a Van Halen jump. Like uh, I don't know if you'll have even witnessed this, Jacoby, but in England, right, there are two songs that whether you are at download or you are not, when it's played on the PA, if they play Chop Suey by System of a Down. The whole crowd will sing along, and if they play Last Resort, every last syllable is sung by sixty thousand people, whether you are in the building or not. Um, the legacy of Last Resort, man. Like I'm feeling it, like you're feeling it. Yeah. How do you even begin to sum it up twenty years down the road? Goosebumps, dude. Straight up, man. I got goosebumps all down my legs right now. I'm tripping. Just I can. Im I'm like. Pl I'm imagining that moment in my mind. Cause I've been to download festival and I understand like the connection and the spirit of the, the vibe and the festival. And it's an honor to have a song that has just impacted people for so many years. It's one of those songs that you could be in the middle of like an airport check-in. And if, if somebody had a boom box and dropped that song, people would be like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's one of those songs. And, you know, I'm just so grateful to be able to, to have that, we could be the vessel to bring that to the people. And it's afforded us a career straight up, man. It's like last resort gives us an opportunity to continually put out new music. You know, here we go with another one. And here's another one because we have that classic in our pocket and uh, we can, we can play it anywhere, anytime. And it, and it just, it captivates people and it transcends all borders, boundaries, beliefs, ideas, genres, people, cliques. It's like, it just brings people together. And, and if I can look at that, that one moment in our career, and if that's all, if that's in the, in the, in the years to come, like if that's the thing that cuts through the mustard and like sticks to people, I'm grateful for it, you know? And, and, and another thing about it is I've met thousands upon thousands of young people that have told me that that song straight saved their life or it saved one of their friends lives. And like, to me, I just, that blows me away to know like a, a song could really speak to somebody's heart when they're in the darkness and that it's, it's inspiring. It makes me want to go back to the drawing board every time, every time we're writing a new song and not that I'm trying to write another last resort, but just knowing that our music can affect people in a deep manner, in a real way, in an authentic way that, that, that brings some light into their darkness. I'm like, that's powerful right there, man. It is. And, and live as well. Like when you get the opportunity, wherever you go, whatever Papa Roach show, being able to pull that ace of spades, like if you f forgive the pardon, out your deck, like yeah. feeling that wave, like literally feeling that wave from us yeah. when you're on the stage, it's got to be insane. Oh, it's such, it's a good, it's a good moment. Every time we do it, you know, it's like, some bands I'll, you know, you go see and it's like when they go play like their earlier hits or their earlier material, it's kind of like they just like, you can see them playing it, but they kind of check out on stage. Yeah. And for me, it's like, it's just, I'm addicted to that energy and that connection. And when that moment happens every time, I'm just like, this is fucking dope. Like <laughs> I live for this because it's a celebrate. It's a celebration. It's like, you know, taking something so dark and so negative and so just ugly in a sense. And it's, and, but it's, it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's moving and uh mm. to have that, the ability to do that shit <laughs> two, two two questions and then i'll let you go man um you mentioned the side project earlier fire in the sky was that the right word was that the right name fight the sky fights the sky okay um was there anyone else involved in this that we would know um so fight the sky was actually um when we toured we had a guitar tech named Wade Kale, and he played guitar for it. He's a great guitar player. Um, my friend Jay Ingram, he's a drummer. He's a great drummer. And then another dude by the name of Ali. So it was a, uh, it's a mix of folks, man. And it's just got some dope riffs. And I actually just hooked up with Jay, the, the original, you know, the drummer for fight this guy. And he was like, you ever think about like pulling those out and like finishing them? And I'm like, man, this quarantine time might be the right time to do something like that. 
you know, and then I'm like, as soon as I say that, then I'm like back into writing new Papa Roach songs. So I'm like, <laughs> man, will I, will I finish this? I don't know. You know, yeah. I, but it's like, God, I, I feel like I need to finish it at some point, man. It's just, I've always been so busy with Papa Roach. I've had all these awesome opportunities over the years that I've, I've kind of like missed out on because I've just been so focused on Papa Roach. I remember Chino from the Deftones sent me a cut back in like 2003 um, to put a vocal on. And that's when we were like trying to refigure out who we were as a band and writing Getting Away With Murder. I was just so focused on that. I'm like, I can't fuck with this right now. I just got to focus on what I'm doing, you know? And so I don't want to always let those opportunities pass me by, man. So who knows what's going to come with that. What was, what was the Chino opportunity? Uh, it was a Deftones track they had sent me that uh, just, it was an instrumental. And he's like, hey, yeah. man, like, you want to come feature on this? I'm like, dude, that'd be so sick. And I honestly think I was like, to be straight, like I was, I was really intimidated by it because Chino, one of my favorite front men, um, Deftones, one of my favorite bands of all time. And it just kind of like, I was like, oh fuck, like this is like intimidating to me. Mm. And uh, part of it was fear, you know, like, am I going to, am I gonna, are they not going to like it? Or are they, you know, insecurity? And uh, I look back at some of those moments. I'm like, man, like, I wish you were a little bit more fearless, Kobe, at that time. <laughs> and, uh, it's life, though. Yeah. Last question. Only only Papa Roach can say, oh, yeah, we're off the road for the first time in all this time. We're taking it easy. And then news comes out that you've got a new record deal, that you're writing for a new record. So even when you're dormant, the train is still rolling. Are you excited about what is next for Papa Roach? And do you think, do you think you'll continue the vibe of the last record? Um, so I am super excited about where Papa Roach is going. It's uh, there's something bubbling and boiling that's great. I, I'm just I'm re feeling really inspired. Um, as far as taking off where we left off, it's always an adventure. You know, it's kind of unraveling before us. Like we're trying, we're starting to to discover what who we are again. It's always a discovery. And uh, I can tell you this: we went in and cut this track called Bloodline, and we had been in quarantine for about almost a month and a half, two months at this time. And we had to get together and create something. We just were like, dude, I'm just itching, man. I need to, I need to make some noise with you guys. And we hooked up and, and the consensus of, amongst the band and our producers that day was there are no fucking rules anymore. Like it's, there never has been, but some, somehow like we feel like we, there are, but we just had that realization that there, there are just, there are no rules in this music. And if we make something that, feels safe or um i guess kind of in the norm it's just going to be boring we can't make a record that is uh three songs that are the singles and then seven songs that are trying to be the singles that's a fucking boring record and uh so we want to make something that's adventurous and, and uh we what we wrote this track called bloodline that's just like i don't know how to explain it, it sounds like a cross between like P. Roach uh, and Devo and, <laughs> and, and Punk, if I could explain it. It's yeah. awesome. <laughs> James, well, just get ready. I always I always expect Punk to come out of your mouth, but Devo, I did not expect. Jacoby, I'll let you get on. Thank you. Mate, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Don't forget, in the description below, you can check out the 20 Years in Fest celebration that was recorded this weekend. Jacoby, when you got new music, I'll chat to you again, my friend. Oh, yeah, B, it's great to see you, man. And I like that Faith No More record in the back. Booyah! I know who my guests are, my man. <laughs> see you soon. Peace out, bro. I genuinely, genuinely love that man. Jacoby Shaddix from Papa Roach. Don't forget, if you didn't check out their Infest in studio show, playing the whole of the Infest album front to back uh, in a rehearsal room in Sacramento where the band are from. Loads of good vibes, really cool pre-show with good shout outs from loads and loads of people from the world of rock and metal and beyond, actually. So, um, yeah, Infest in studio available now. Check out the link in the description below before I introduce our next guest. Now, Jesse Leach is an intense individual. 
And these are intense times, which is why it was the perfect time to give him a call. Not only that, though, he is on the brand new Machine Head sort of EP, I guess. They've released two songs called Civil Unrest. The lead track is a song called Stop the Bleeding, which features Rob Flynn firing barbs against Jesse Leach. And um, if you are a fan of what Jesse does, he talks a lot about a lot of the things that he's got going on creatively. It is far more than just Kill Switch and this guest slot. Um, but here he is to tell you all about it. Mosh Talks with Bees, Jesse Leach. I am joined by Kill Switch Engage frontman Jesse Leach. Mate, uh, how has lockdown been for you? Like, um, we were just talking about the need for human interaction yeah it's been a mixed bag dude you know honestly i i really can't sit here and complain about stuff but um yeah i definitely miss a lot of things but uh in the same breath it's it's really slowed me down and, and uh it really enabled me to like live a different life to stay still to to be still and to to view everything with a different perspective so mm. it's been beautiful at the same time as it's been hard um but more importantly, just the state of the world is what bothers me more than anything. Uh, on my end, things aren't so bad, you know? Yeah, I, I understand that because it's it's a crazy time to be a deep thinker, which is something that I always associate with you. Um, you have just done this track, Stop the Bleeding, with Rob Flynn yeah. uh, and the Machine Head gang. Um Let's go straight into the track before I ask about how you know each other and all the rest of it, because if we're talking about human history, Jesse, I always associate you. I know you're in a metal band, but I always associate you with hardcore and punk and ska and yeah, man. music that is about unity. With that in mind, was that why a song like Stop the Bleeding appealed as well as it being with your buddies in Machine Head? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a message that I've been saying for many, many years. Uh, and a message that I feel like gets misconstrued now that we're living in such weird, diverse times. Uh, divisive times, I should say. Mm. Um, because the message gets clouded. I mean, the song is called Stop the Bleeding. It's asking for the violence and brutality to stop. It's a positive message, but it's also a righteous message of anger. And it's not about one particular person. This is about stuff that's been going on for decades and decades and decades and yeah at the core of that message is unity absolutely but crazy enough it actually serves to divide people which blows my mind where we are in these days where calling for an end to police brutality has caused division amongst people just blows my mind it's it's a wild time man like did you find it cathartic to get this out because being a, being a naturally creative person and with the world in the, the situation that it's in, not only getting the chance to do something musically, but to do something musically that is something that you believe in. Did you find it somewhat cathartic to do Stop the Bleeding? Yeah, I think if anything, it just kind of made me feel like I was contributing to something I believe in to, to raise that sort of collective consciousness right now, uh, which I think we desperately need um, because I think people's senses are being dulled by, uh, you know, shifty media. And, and honestly, this, I hope, if nothing else, can open up a greater conversation about just corruption from the powers that be in general. There's a lot of like crazy, deceptive things going on. Uh, and for me to, to point at this particular issue right now is important because this is where I feel our attention needs to be drawn. But in the same breath, it's about a much bigger picture, too. I feel like humanity doesn't realize the power that we have as individuals to create change, to inflict change. If we actually banded together and started to have this open discussion about what we can do to make change, we would have so much power. But we are constantly divided by media. And it just blows my mind. It makes me angry, really. Mm. But, um, yeah, of course. I'm proud to work with Machine Head. Rob is... Uh, become an old friend over the years and someone I definitely have admired since the beginning of Machine Head. So total honor and a total pleasure. And I feel like it's, you know, it gives me purpose, you know, when I was working yeah. on it, I felt a real good sense of purpose while doing that. 
when you speak about division, does it blow your mind that division exists within the alternative rock, metal, hardcore community? Like that has been, uh, I've always felt, I felt naive, man. Like in the, I I just thought that a a culture that is for the outsider, right? Like this music spoke to me and changed my life and pulled me in because it was the first place that I felt I truly belonged. And that was that. Maybe it's my personal my personal experience. Um, yeah, I but I was me. I was shocked when I saw the counter argument to it. Like, has it been a, a as someone involved with the creation of the track? Is it like it must got to be even more mind blowing? It's definitely mind blowing. But you know, I'm also a realist. As much as I you know really champion unity and love and all of these great values that we should be upholding uh, as a human race we live in an age of war we live in an age of uh of greed and our rulers uh for better for worse are immersed in that particular type of culture that's the way of the world so yes i love metal hardcore punk the underground music it the reason i even got into it is because i did find my tribe and it was a counter culture but as this music has grown in popularity uh through the internet and, and what have you it's it's welcomed a bunch of people in from other walks of life and become more of a mainstream thing. So when anything gets more mainstream, you're going to have that that popular voice or, if, if you will, that, that brainwashed media voice. You know, if you're steeped in the punk and hardcore and metal underground, there is definitely unity there from, from many years ago. But where we sit as of right now, for better or for worse, metal has become a huge genre of music and one that has power behind it. So it doesn't shock me that there is an oppositioning view and the little voices that will creep in to sort of take away from the main driving point. Um, It's just something you got to deal with as an artist and you have to have thick skin and you have to let people speak and hopefully they'll come to their own conclusions and find a common ground amongst each other without you policing their opinions too much. And I think that's another thing to be careful of is you can't police people's minds. You can't police people's opinions. You need to let them speak, give them a platform to discuss. And with my page, I've learned to do that. As much as people piss me off in some of their comments, I've learned to just back away from the comments, let people talk. And most of the time, the problem gets solved or the fans will come to the aid and make the point again, and I don't have to do anything. But Mm -hmm. music needs to speak to people to create that stimulus. You know, the whole saying of like leading a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. My hope is with nothing else in my lyrics, I'm leading you to the water and you can choose to drink or, or to be thirsty. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't believe in brainwashing either. I, I'm a big believer in conversation. Like, we're all humans. Even if you see something differently to me, we could talk about it. We ain't got to agree. But, like, there's sometimes there's a line when, uh, I don't know, man. Let's let's talk about Machine Head. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, we could talk we we you know? for hours about this. Hours. I know, I know. And it, as well, it's like... You can't do right for doing wrong at the moment, so it's a fucking terrifying time to even be talking now, about you said you things. Just have to lead, you have to lead, you have to have some balls, and you have to stick by what you feel is right, and that's it. If people are going to talk shit, they're going to talk shit, so be it. Yeah, fair, fair. When did you meet Rob? When Did you remember when you first met the, the Machine Head guys? Yeah, I met Rob very briefly at the Roadrunner United show in 2006, but it was just so quick. Um, and then when Times of Grace came out, he was like a huge fan of Times of Grace, that first record. And, uh, he decided to take us out in, um, well, we were doing the Soundwave festivals in Australia and so was Machine Head. So when you do Soundwave back in the day in Australia, you had sideshows, uh, and Machine Head basically asked us to do all the sideshows. And on one of the flights from Sydney to, I think it was to, to Melbourne, Rob approached me in the airport and sat next to me and, and just started telling me that he was a fan of that Times of Grace record and what it meant to him. And I'm just sitting there like it's blowing my mind that, you know, this dude that I used to listen to back in the, the glory days when it was like the the bands that really shook my world were Machine Head, Sepultura, the early Roadrunner Records stuff was like the altar of metal. Like if I were to listen to metal, it was that kind of metal that I mm. dig on. And here's this guy like telling me that he's a fan of what I do. It just blew my mind. And yeah since then we've had a mutual respect we've hung out a few times here and there we've talked online but i just love him because he's unapologetically himself he doesn't care what people think 
And, you know, he pisses off people with what he says. And I love that. You should be doing it. That's what fucking rock and roll and metal is all about. Piss people off and speak your mind. And he does that. And I totally respect that. I don't have to agree with every single thing he says, but I love that dude. I think he's uh, his heart is in the right place. Regardless of how he can lash out sometimes. <laughs> do, do you, um, when you talk about the Times of Grace record, has there been any work on further Times of Grace stuff in yeah. these lock in this lockdown period? It feels like everyone's going to the well on not only their their projects that they're mainly known for, but it feels like there's other stuff brewing as well. Yeah, Times of Grace record is done. Uh, we have enough song for a full length record and enough song for an EP afterwards if we choose to. Uh, we've decided to separate the two batches of songs. Um, it's done and done, and I'm extremely proud of it. And I think it's probably the best work that Adam and I have ever done in our careers. Not only because it's something we're proud of lyrically and what it stands for, and it's much different from the first record. Um, I just think because it's diverse, it shows a little bit more of a rock side, a little bit more of a stoner sort of um, post-metal side. It shows more blues. It just It gave us freedom to just do whatever we wanted to do. That and um, Adam took the reins on, I want to say half the record is, is him leading and half is me. And then we come together on songs. So you're going to hear a lot more of Adam's creativity in his voice. Uh, and I wrote a couple of songs that he sang and it just he brought a whole different light to it. So I'm extremely proud of that. And then I have my punk band, The Weapon. We just put out in, uh, a, a full length. Got more of that to come. I also have a project called Dead Trees I've been quietly working on, which is industrial metal dubstep weird electronic shit uh yeah i'm keeping busy dude it's it's really the only thing keeping me sane and then i also have an ambient project called the way back within which is like meditational like calming like anti-anxiety sort of uh the kind of music you hear in like a massage parlor you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's really mellow stuff so i've got a bunch of stuff going on yeah and i, I love it i've just i gotta stay creative i have to so Deep Trees, is there anyone else involved with that or is that just yeah, you? Yeah, my girlfriend, um, she does vocals and eventually what we're going to do when we start presenting it, I'll be doing the electronics, DJing, programming, backup screaming and whatever. She'll be doing the main vocals and she's also an aerial performer. She does silk, she does pole. So we're going to incorporate her doing live performance while we're performing once we get to that point. Uh, and it's really dark and sexy and... and sort of trip hop industrial with some real heavy metal and bass beats like dubstep all kind of mashed into one little beast. So it should uh, be interesting. And your med very different for me. Your meditational stuff. Have you ever like forgive forgive me if I'm putting ideas in your head here, but have you ever considered doing the guided meditational stuff? Because like this uh, between you and I, like and everyone listening, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> like this shit changed my life. Like literally like no hyperbole like being able to tap into within really changed my life and i think that so many people could benefit from it like i'm super stoked to hear a that you're doing something in that realm but could, could you give us a little bit more inside that yeah yeah and for anyone who's curious if you go on Bandcamp and look up the way back within that's my i got five songs up there um yeah, I know the guided meditation thing is, is cool. I don't think I'm the one to do it, though. I mean, I could do like sort of a, you know, a monotone meditational voice thing, but uh, mm. I'm no teacher when it comes to that stuff. And uh, yeah, meditation is super crucial. And I think one thing I need to point out with people who, who uh, when they hear that word meditate, it seems like a very daunting and sort of um, intimidating thing. Like you've got to be this monk, you know, zoning out for hours in the cosmos when in all actuality, Meditation can be two minutes of your time where you put your damn phone on silent, turn it off, sit and just be and breathe and just try to clear your mind or try to focus on one thing and be present in the moment. It can be two minutes. It can be a minute. And you'd be surprised how little effort goes such a long way into sort of uh, rewiring your brain and, and helping you to calm and refocus on things. I found it extremely like helpful for, for anxiety and panic mode, learning how to breathe properly, learning how to be still. Uh, it's definitely something very important, but I don't see myself as a teacher when it comes to that stuff. But I think my music will definitely help people who are trying to sort of search that out. Uh, I and very intentionally wrote the songs on certain BPMs, so it goes with breathing, goes with heart rate. And I've even 
tricked people into slowing their breathing down through the music. It's something very intentional, but it's very subliminal at the same time. And so I'll, I'll ask a little bit more about Times of Grace because it's br- a, it's fucking great to see you as visibly excited about it as you are with it being done. Um, with Kill Switch and your songwriting dynamic with Adam, like there is a Kill Switch sound that you'll try and pull into other areas. Like people want a certain thing from Kill Switch yeah. with Times of Grace. Is it nice being able to blow that up and just be like roads where we're going? We don't need roads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I've been able to explore like the lower register of my voice, which, you know, since having the vocal surgery, since having sort of relearning my instrument since my surgery, I realized that I've neglected a huge part of my voice. So in the Times of Grace stuff, I try to go lower in some of the stuff. And then when I do go high, Adam's voice is there on the bottom with the harmony. So we're really playing with harmonies and sounds and it's given me freedom to sing softer and calmer and parts that uh, I'm not used to doing because kill switch is like pretty much high. It's like a very driving high sort of vocal style. Um, and that being said though, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like moving forward with kill switch, I definitely want to try new things with that as well. I think we have had our kill switch sound. We have had our moment with that, but I feel like we've been doing this long enough where we're going to push a little bit with that as well. So I'm just open to just trying new things. I don't ever want to be comfortable in my own skin with any project. I want to continue to challenge myself. So Times of Grace is a nice way of stretching that muscle and also opening my eyes to the possibilities of having Times of Grace sound leak into Kill Switch. You know, it doesn't have to be yeah. vice versa. And I think that that's important for us as Kill Switch to realize that we don't have to stay within these certain boundaries that uh, our career and fans sort of expect from us. In mm. fact, I think that can be detrimental to a band as well. Unless you're ACDC, and if it's not broken, don't fucking fix it. Yeah, absolutely. ACDC, Motorhead, fine. Yeah, um, don't, don't fucking touch that shit. <laughs> so, uh, just to finish up on Times of Grace and to, to finish up on this chat in general, um, do you find yourself in a good creative spot at the minute, Jesse? Like, I love, I love what you do as a vocalist, man. Like, you're a fucking blessing to our scene. And being able to to know that there's more coming. Is it like, I know it's a shit part of human history and it's, it's, it's hard to issue like positivity in a time when so many of our fellow humans are in a time of shit. But do you feel creatively fulfilled with like all of these directions and all of these things that you can do with your vocals and the fact that you're still learning what you can do for your vocals? At this point in 2020, do you feel creatively fulfilled? I don't think the word fulfilled is a good one to use for me because I'm never really fulfilled. <laughs> I'm constantly pushing and constantly wanting more. And I think any artist should if you want to continue to grow and and be relevant not only to yourself but to society to, to have something to say. And I, I think I'll always have something to say for sure. But it's been a struggle. You know, there are days where I, I get up and I just like, I got to write, I got to do this. And then there are days when I'm, I'm fucking staying in bed and I'm watching all four Indiana Jones movies, even the bad one. Like I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm a human, you know, and I have days where I don't want to get out of bed and I don't want to check the internet. I don't want to see what's going on. And I've had those days where I don't. And thankfully I live in the middle of a national park so I can just fuck off for the day and like go lose myself. And then when I come back, I've got more strength and I have more purpose and more intention to continue to create and hopefully make a difference because I don't do this for, you know, fame or money because if I did, I'd be out of this for a long, long time ago, man. But uh, this is what I live for. I live to try to spread a message that I believe in and I live for raising people's awareness and hopefully bringing, shedding light on issues that I feel are important and things like racism Things like, um, you know, being against war and violence. Um, these things are universal. These things uh, I was steeped in in the punk and hardcore scene. And it's part of my, um, you know, it's part of my upbringing. It's part of my roots. It's part of my culture. Uh, we have to try to, like, strive to be better as humans. And I think if nothing else, that's my motivation. Whether or not I'm inspired to write music or, you know, to write poetry or work on something, I try to live it on a daily basis, even with just interacting and communicating with people here in my community, in my neighborhood, or somebody I see in the store, extending a hand 
of courtesy, extending uh, just something nice to say to somebody or making eye contact and smiling with your eyes underneath the mask. It can be something as small as that as to something as large as creating a, an entire record that is a protest, which I did with The Weapon, which I'm very proud of that record. Mm. If you guys are fans of punk anarchist shit, definitely check out The Weapon. Really into that well, shit. Well, yeah, I mean, overall, dude, I, I just, I'm trying to live it. I don't want to just write about it. I don't want to just put it into my music. I'm trying to put it into my daily life. Well, we'll put the description uh, in the description below a link to the Weapon record so that you can check that out. Are we likely to hear Times of Grace this year, do you think? I hope so. I hope so. I think we're uh, we're pacing ourselves. We're trying to be smart with how we're going to put it out, how we're going to present it. You know, the last record, there was a lot of visuals to accompany the record. I want to make sure we roll it out in a very sort of artistic way where um, I want nothing more than people to sort of get the chills on their arm and the back of their neck when they get the first taste of what we're going for. So um, you know, we're working diligently behind the scenes to find it if we're going to find a home on a record label, if we're going to do it independently, uh, but it must be to a certain standard. I mean, hell, we've waited this long to put this thing out. So we're going to make sure when we roll it out, it's exactly how we want it to be rolled out with the artwork and the feel and the vibe. I just want it to be something so different and hopefully refreshing to the music community, uh, something that people don't see coming. We'll see what happens. The passion off of that man just flies through the screen at you or through your eardrums if you're listening to us. I love chatting to him every single time. You should check out Jesse's punk band. They are called The Weapon. Their album is called A Repugnant Turn of Events. I've left a description for the band camp in the description below, so get on that look forward to times of grace and kill switch and all things jesse leach moving forward in the future this next interview it's weird man like i've been interviewing people in bands for years and years and years and i'm always fascinated by every single artist they've all got something to say they've all got something unique and they've all got something that you need to hear but it's rare that i speak to someone in a field that i have never interviewed anyone before but that is the case of our next chat mick gordon is the name of the composer of doom and doom eternal now if you haven't played these games you know doom obviously i'm not going to do you the disservice of what's doom um but the gnarly soundtrack and the sinister sounds and the sheer evil and the modern take on industrial and how that provides mood and texture and all of these things within the walls of bastard heavy metal. Um, it's a fascinating bit of work and... That's why we had to have him on this show. Mosh Talks is always going to be about more than the music. If something is culturally significant to you, then we want to put it on this show. If you've got any ideas for people we should interview from outside the world of rock and metal, use that comment section, man. Let us know. We're watching. We'll pay attention. Um, but for now, composer of Doom and Doom Eternal and all-round top man Mick Gordon from Australia, uh, on Mosh Talks with me, Bees. I've been interviewing people for ages, but I have never done uh, spoken to someone who does what you do, Mick. So, Mick Gordon, our composer of Doom Eternal's entire soundscapes. Before we get into all of that sort of thing, though... What was your entry point to writing and composing music? Like, were you in bands and things like that before uh, entering that kind of realm? Not really, man. I kind of, you know, got into it pretty young. So I left high school and I was playing in cover bands and teaching guitar and stuff just to kind of make a living. And uh, I really wanted to write music, but uh, I wasn't quite good enough to get into like film or television. And that's a pretty difficult industry to break into down here in Australia anyway. But what was down here in Australia was 40 video game companies. And at that time, there was really not many people here that were doing sound and music for video games. So for me, it was like this kind of open market staring me in the face. It was right place, right time sort of stuff. So I started like burning CDs and, you know, making tunes and stuff like that, sending it out to game developers. And to my surprise, they started calling me back. Um, for them, I think it was just a convenience thing. They were able to work with me directly here in Australia rather than going overseas. Mm. And I would kind of started doing that when I was about 17, 18, pretty young. So that was kind of my intro into it all. 
And so, uh, like, when I look at your credits, you've also done Killer Instinct and Wolfstein. Like, has your entry point and your work within video gaming always been on the gnarlier end of games? <laughs> oh, um, when I started, I just took whatever job I could get. My first couple of jobs were like Nickelodeon games, you know, like SpongeBob SquarePants and Jimmy <laughs> and Jimmy Phantom and stuff like that. But it was great, man, because you kind of, you know, you don't grow up playing guitar to do that sort of stuff. So you have to learn that sort of thing on the spot. And and writing music for like a Nickelodeon franchise is a whole different ball game. It's it's got its own set of challenges, you know. So uh, so I kind of started there. Uh, it wasn't until sort of after a few years I started getting my teeth into some of the more aggressive stuff. So which brings us quite neatly to Doom. Uh, I wondered at what point do they bring you in? To start, to start uh, building soundscapes. Like, do, are you there from the very beginning, or do they start developing the game and sending you ideas? Like, when do you enter the process of this? Well, each project's different, as you can imagine. But typically, I like to be brought in pretty early, and at that stage, like, there is really no game. There might be some sort of temp game where it's like a grey boxed world with you know triangles and rectangles and squares and your character can kind of jump up and down and one of these squares might be moving and you can kind of shoot something at it and it's like it's really really early stuff it's nothing that sort of represents a video game but what they do have at that time is concept artists and the concept artists are working really really hard to try and define the look of the game and getting that stuff man especially on a project like Doom Every single piece of concept art is like a 70s, you know, metal album cover. And um, that's the stuff that I find is the most inspiring because I'm able to kind of get in early on that sort of initial creativity train. And then you're able to really like develop the musical sound alongside the game. So I like to get in nice and nice and early. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes you come in super late and it's all like all hands on deck just to try to get the thing out the door. But uh, yeah, I like to get in pretty early. And something that really stands out about the the massive amount of music that you created for Doom Eternal and Doom is it feels like even when there's nothing in the way of like more traditional metal soundscapes, everything is built with sinister and evil in mind like there isn't a lot of space for fragility and sort of overall niceness here um do you have much in the way of like a growing up love for metal because it really if you if you don't i'll be astounded given how how, how grisly and grim like the music is for doom well, I mean, there's a couple of things to that. Yes, of course, like my first introductions to music was more like, uh, you know, blues and, and uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix and, and all that sort of thing. But, you know, thinking of that stuff at the time, like Hendrix and Cream during the 60s, like that was the early heavy metal there, right? So then going to Black Sabbath and then going in further and further until you get, you know, more and more sinister stuff that was happening in the 80s and 90s and sort of thing. So, you know, metal's always been there. But when on a video game project, you talk more about feelings than you do about genres. And with something like Doom, it's all about sonic aggression. So it's, it's this sort of loud, abrasive, angry, fast paced, high fidelity type of sound. And that's what the game needs and that's what the game represents. So the music is kind of informed by that. And sometimes the best way to get that is with nine string guitars and double kick drums and, you know, super, super speed stuff, angry stuff. Sometimes it's you, you get there through synthesizers and uh, running synths from, uh, you know, the, the early 80s Soviet sort of period through like crazy uh, effects pedal chains and things like that, whatever it is, anything to make like a really aggressive or, as you said, like sinister sound. Mm. So we talk more about feelings than we do genres. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess what I wanted to ask is, were there any particular bands that stand out as far as bands that influenced your writing for Doom? Like, I was listening to, uh, was, let me just make sure I get the song title right, it's Soul Extraction had 
a guitar tone that had that almost Meshuggah style elastic feel to it. I wondered if there were any particular bands that you would cite as influences for the, the Doom Eternal soundtrack. I kind of love everything, man. What's interesting is like, I think the same things that inspires a game like Doom also inspires a lot of metal game bands, right? So it's aggression, it's satanic themes, it's uh, power fantasy, it's violence. All this sort of stuff also, you know, inspires lots of different metal bands. So I love that sort of stuff as well. Mm. Um, for that, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Meshuggah. I've, I've uh, you know, known Frederick from Meshuggah for quite a while, and I love that guy so much. He's such a really creative, interesting musician. And uh, he got to come on board with us for a couple of Wolfenstein tracks, which was a lot of fun as well. So um, I think more it's like we're all just in a really similar headspace, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess that's the thing, man. Yeah. It's interesting. When you say satanic themes, like, because there's so many different ways of taking that, because that can be anything from, like, I was watching The Wicker Man last night, the original Wicker Man, and all the kind of folk music from that has a kind of almost satanic feel to guttural heavy metal. Um, what are, there, are there any kind of visual cues that you take for for the, the music? So I'll give you an example. Right. In WWE, there's a guy called Jim Johnson. Right. And he he writes the theme music for people that come out. Right. So seven foot big show kind of lumbering. His music is boot is blues orientated dum, 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 because he moves like that. So do you have to get inspiration like that for things like that one eyed fucker in Doom? Yeah, of course, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Um when I'm working on a project, they're always sending me videos or concept art like we were talking about before. And um, you got to kind of numb your brain a little bit and just sort of imagine yourself in that video game already and try and sort of envision what, what sounds might be the most appropriate. And it's weird, like when you really tap into it, you feel more like a musical archaeologist. It's almost like the music is already there. It just becomes your job to kind of uncover it, you know, and you'll find this tone that works really well or this tempo that works really well or this key that works really well and then over time you start to build this picture of what the music's going to sound like sometimes that comes from the visuals but another big part of video games is obviously the interactive nature of it so you're playing through these hellscapes you know these satanic imagery uh is something that's coming alive and you're playing through it so um there's that engagement level as well and all of these things are feeding back into the music when you when you talk about the colouring of tones and things like that, something that fascinates me particularly about your Doom soundtrack is I am really into the the ASMR style feel of of where heavy music is going. This band that we featured quite prominently called Code Orange, who have featured that within their heaviness. Um, do you think that that's something that can make heavy music have a more mainstream relevancy? Because, you know, it, it feels like that type of music and that type, like our, our type of music and where technology is for audio are kind of natural bedfellows. If you want a sonic aggression and to be punished from various different points on the ear, it feels like like metal might go in that direction as someone that deals with sound and loads of those elements because it has an interactive nature. Do you think that's a fair point? Man, it's such a good point. And I like, interestingly, music has always been inspired by technology and, and, and whatever is current technology and future technologies is going to change music again. So whatever stuff is on the horizon will definitely influence uh, the way we can do things. There's all sorts of stuff we can do nowadays with uh, bass frequencies and sub frequencies and things. And that's really influenced the way in it, its way into uh, to, to metal music as well. Right. Um, mm. be a lot more accurate now with uh, computer based editing and things. And that is, you know, almost bred whole genres uh, and, and different changes and things. Um, it's an art form, so it's always going to have people that are going to react against that stuff too. And I'm loving, you know, bands that want to go in and record completely analog, straight to tape, bounce it off to vinyl, and that goes out to a small fan base, like, yeah. you know, that sort of thing as well. So, 
but yeah, with regards to like ASMR or, uh, you know, this sort of thing, I don't know, like, like for me, an interesting one again with the video game things is that the video game itself is almost the vessel that, uh, new audiences can can be introduced to different styles of music. And so there might be people out there that really love a good first-person shooter and they'll play something like Doom, and it, it gives us an opportunity to kind of insert certain metal-type sounds into their uh, lives, you know, and that's quite an interesting thing too. I think these days if you want any sort of um, leg up in the music industry, you've really got to find some sort of cultural attachment, you know. Um, and for me, with video games, that's become that. I've been able to be very fortunate to be part of this, like, big cultural explosion called video games. And uh, and the music sort of rides along with that, you know? So, uh, yeah, man, of course, it's always been hand-in-hand hand with the technology that's around. <clears throat> and, like... I won't keep much more of your time because I know you're super busy at the moment. The the um, the actual experience of recording the Doom soundtrack because there's video footage of you know like loads and loads of people involved. Can you tell us um, how you involved other musicians from the world of metal and the actual experience of recording it all? Because it looked it looked both complex and fun. Yeah, man. Originally, there was this idea uh, when we started Doom Eternal that we wanted this chant, right? There was going to be these ancient sections of the game, and we thought it'd be really cool if there was like a crowd in this like gladiator coliseum uh, that were chanting, right, while you're kind of fighting these demons in the middle of this coliseum. And um, I'm always trying to find like, you know, that little bit further, like how much further can we push it? What else can we do? What's a little bit interesting that, that maybe hasn't been done before or whatever? And we thought, what would be more appropriate to Doom than having the, the chant screamed and shouted by a choir of heavy metal screamers? And uh, once we hit onto that idea, it's like, oh, man, this is great. That's really going to influence the way the soundtrack is going to sound. If we have four hours in this recording space with, you know, 24 uh, metal screamers, it's, it's, that's unique. I, ha I haven't experienced that in a video game before. Um, so I put out this open call and I, I gathered a whole bunch of different metal singers into uh, this space in Austin and Texas. Um, man, we had some awesome people there. We had Sven from Aborted. We had Tony Campos from like, uh, you know, Fear Factory Ministry and, uh, and Static X, obviously. Um, you know, so many amazing people turned up for this thing. And it was such an incredible thing, man. I think like that's probably my favorite memory from, from Doom Eternal is that one day of recording there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's you, like, again, with video games, man, you're just allowed to kind of, with the right project, of course, experience and experiment with these sorts of things and create something that's a little bit more unique and interesting at the end of the day, which is really the ultimate goal there. Mm. And last question, what's next, Mick? What are you working on at the moment? Anything exciting? Yeah, man, I've just got some uh, some production stuff for bands that have been doing this week, actually. I think that track comes out this week, but I won't say anything about that just yet. But, uh, yeah, so some of that stuff, man. I'm doing a horror game next, uh, which is going to be really, really cool. Um, yeah, man, I mean, there's always lots of little things. I'm really into, like, lots of different creative projects at the moment. So mm. uh, that's the thing we're doing, yeah. Well, I'll get back in contact when you've got your horror game and it's out and all the rest of it. Come back and talk to us anytime, Mick. The soundtrack absolutely slams, man. Like, I can feel the, the fillings in my teeth rattling as I'm playing the game. Brilliant stuff, Mick. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. If you haven't played Doom or Doom Eternal, you should go and do that right now. Well, not right now. We've got another couple of interviews to go, but you should certainly do that. I mean, even if something as metal as the idea of running around an alien planet killing demons that have escaped from a hellscape doesn't sell you enough, the soundtrack, I promise you, has some of the most forward-thinking heavy sounds that I've heard on it in quite some time. And, uh, yeah. All the more reason to go around and play it. Doom Eternal is out now. Okay, next guest. We go to Sweden to meet Johannes Eckerstrom from Avatar. Their new album, Hunter Gatherer, is on the way. And there's always an incredible visual aspect with Avatar. We talk to some bands on here that are really gnarly and get inside themselves and some really dark emotions and some intense conversations. And there are other bands that are here to provide a little fun. But there's more to Avatar's brand of fun than meets the eye. As you will hear, 
and see with Johannes Eckerstrom from Avatar and me, Bees, here on Mosh Talk. I'm joined by Johannes from Avatar. Mate, it seems like a weird point in human history to be saying it's been a good week. But after seeing the reaction to God of Sick Dreams last week, it was quite overwhelming on my timeline, just how into it your fan base were. Um, What's your feelings on releasing that track from Hunter Gatherer and how people have taken to it? Well, I'm... (laughs) This is a better better question question than than you think. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because it is, it it is like you say, this uh, whole thing of everything going on in the world. And if you mix that with the fact that, you know, we, this, I have heard the song many times already long before it was put out. Then I like to have this little, that little ritual of, uh, of uh, giving it a listen on some kind of official platform as well to see like ah it's it's out there no it, it's what can i say it, it's it was good it was nice and it was uh that combined i guess with the reactions for uh silence in the age of apes like those two s- blows uh, punches to people's faces in a row has been really nice to see and that people are all in all describing the music the way we view it, if that makes sense. Yeah, like when I, when I look at, like your records always are quite varied and go into different places and portions mm-hmm. of uh, of your sound. So I guess what I'm going to ask is these two tracks that we've heard so far, how much do they tell us about Hunter Gatherer as a wider picture? Oh. Huh. They well, they tell they tell a fair share of uh, they give away a fair share of what the album is about, meaning uh, it's all based in, on that riff, and it's heavy and aggressive, and it's dark and uh, lyrically they're like right there at the crossroads of where your inner being is clashing with a whole world and universe. So in that sense, I guess it it's it tells a lot about the album as a whole. While at the same time, they're both very very driven, aggressive songs, and I guess we have more what you would maybe call groovy things as well, heavy things as well, and and mellow things, you know. So in that sense, in that sense, you're really really just getting one slice of it because yeah, like you like you described us, we like to do. We like to write different songs every time. There's, mm-hmm. I, there's, I only ever find it's. There's only a reason to write each song once. Mm. There's, there's a lot of talking um, about concepts and crea- and creation of the outside world when it comes to Avatar traditionally. So when you talk about the inner self battling the outer world, like is Hunter Gatherer a, a more autobiographical record, uh, like a bit more personal to you, Johannes, than than usual? Uh, not really, but at the same time, yeah, because I guess it's more blatantly so. Right. This time, there, there's no metaphor hidden, in, you know, where the truth is hidden behind stories about an owl. There is, and there is no, uh, it's not clad in this uh, veil of comedy this time. So in that sense, yes, I, I think that, that that goes all hand in hand with how we uh, think the process. If, if you write music the way our ambition is to write it, and that is to always find a way to feel like a beginner to make it feel new and important and urgent to do this. One thing I guess you have to do is find another layer as you get older is find another layer of bullshit to peel off from that onion, that onion of, uh, you know, your inner essence, your yeah. inner onion. And by, and I think this was definitely a lot of steps forward in that direction where you know, I, I've never felt dishonest in what I put on an album, but you know, with with the years comes less less and less time is being wasted at being self-conscious. 
mm. and more and more of it is being spent trying to get the, to the bottom of whatever you're trying to say and or getting to the core of it and mm. you know sometimes that core is totally abstract and sometimes it's very concrete but i think i have better access to it than ever before and so all of us as a band you mentioned like wanting to feel like a beginner and like keeping keeping things fun like you mm -hmm. recorded the record again with the great jay ruston um when you talk about doing things that, that make you feel like a beginner what i wanted to ask you about hunter gatherer is what have you done that is completely new for avatar is there anything on this record that you've tried your hand at that is completely unique in the, in your back catalog uh the most blatant thing must be yeah the fact that there's a very very mellow vulnerable piano i guess you would call it a ballad on its mm. uh subject wise and again it's it's a shining a different kind of light on still things that i feel is avatar territory uh but on the surface at least very much it's uh something you would recognize uh, something you won't immediately recognize sorry mm. as an avatar thing then and the way the way we perceive it with the stuff we make it makes complete sense but yeah you know the the uh, the make people cry piano ballad is on this album maybe yeah. someone longed for that one maybe we're <laughs> bombing someone else i don't know <laughs> what what was the excitement like for for doing that where does the inspiration come for doing that like you say on the surface level it will make sense to to like the ad to the avatar community what's beneath the surface on that song Oof. uh i think being vulnerable like it's it musically again it's just it's, it's a vulnerable sounding song but I think the whole the whole thing is about vulnerability. That's a wonderful word for a Swede to pronounce vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, and it's kind of dealing with, I guess, in a way like how to open up to the world, how you know the pain of giving someone the ability to hurt you, but maybe the necessity of in life to give people that ability mm. because there's so much that comes where that comes with the territory if if you get what i mean yeah so it's it really it i think that's one of the reasons you do such a mellow poetic song about it because it really it moves in a dark and very complicated it's it's very complicated you know the the angry songs is easier you know, what are you pissed off about well I saw, I saw, I saw all these pictures of uh, dead seabirds with a belly full of plastic. That's fucked up. You know, there is easier. That's an easier spark for something. And this mm. is really trying to deconstruct something about mm, loss and the, and mistakes and regret mm. and uh, and again, like how love can be weaponized i guess mm. and it's it's easier to to handle sadness with anger than it is for mm -hmm. sadness to come to the fore uh, yeah. the thing is, it's like it's crazy to be going down this direction because when i look at an avatar album is coming out in early august i like my gut instinct was like thank god that there's a bit of fun coming because yeah, like you know like you're quite right to say heaviness and to say darkness and to say groove about your music but mm. like i talk to five musicians a week for this show and you get people that have like got a steely intensity and it's all over their music and then mm. there's bands that ha that have more technicolor um is it fair yeah. to say that that's what avatar bring and it's it's yeah. kind of for for me personally. It's kind of a good time to be getting some fun escapism and some avatar in our lives. Yeah, well, th that's the that's the weird thing with us, right? Because we're still not uh, we're still not. Well, what what band should I bring as an example? Alestorm is singing about pirates. You know, mm. it's it's still 
if you, you really go back and look at what the songs have been about, it's, it's always been that layer of sincerity and seriousness in it that then has gone, I guess, gone in hand in hand with uh, where the fun and technicolor comes in is embracing, you know, insanity, embracing yourself, I guess, and a whole lot of things. Like we are, we are a strange band. We and we realize it, and we we like it, you know. Uh, Ah, oh, it's uh, it's weird. Like it's a, uh, it's weird to look at yourself from the outside uh, like that. But I don't know. Like, let us die on black walls. You know, I learned, I learned about how uh, in certain regions of the world, uh, mass rape uh, was used as a you know, as a weaponized strategy a way to uh, ruin communities that you were at war with and around the time of the writing of those lyrics is when it finally became according to the security council in the united nations uh, a war crime where it could persecute officers for the crimes of the soldiers in that sense because if you can prove that that was done on order of someone mm -hmm. and uh, so there's no lack of that in our back catalog either yeah. then of course avatar country happened but also, prior to that, you know, feathers and flesh happened, which is mm. interesting because if you really delve into what the lyrics are about, the journey, how it all ends, as we did an album about failure, we did an album about death, fear of death, and about regrets. And then, but however, there was bees, they were bees and a pike and, a, and an eagle and an owl and all these other things. And as we started to be work in such a conceptual way and as we start to react against i guess rebel against people's expectations of what a metal band was supposed to be mm. all the fun and silliness became uh, you know sword and shield and uh, how we approached the world and uh, none of that is still i guess going away mm. it's, the whole thing with avatar i guess is we we do the music we do because that's what we want to do. And what we want to do changes ever so slightly all the time. But, mm. you know, we are very committed on to the fact that Avatar is metal music. Yeah. And then we are a theater group. And, you know, this is not a concept album, but we treat things that we do very much as a concept. Uh, like the band is as a whole is a concept. And therefore, we are working in very theatrical ways with things and there the fun and games spill in any way i guess but Ooh. now right now the focus is on something more pitch black and it's unrelated to what goes on in the world there's always something pitch black to deal with i well it has a lot to do with, with what's going on in the world but not necessarily just right at the moment of the release of the album mm. I just think also because we really felt, okay, now let's get the humor out of our systems. That was one of the ways, one of the things that led to our country. Uh, as we did that, we also suppressed all that energy that we otherwise would process with our music. You know, there's a, I took a self-therapy gap year, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now it's all coming out. <laughs> Well, I mean, that leads into asking about, um, so, so again, like, so I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to get to chat to people before their records come out. And like, I always love getting to do the Ramstein chats because um, when you talk to Richard from Ramstein and he talks about when you create a record, like mm. Ramstein albums also have this other world that is videos, yeah. that is a stage show, and mm. your band came to mind as well. And with this yeah. being with this being uh after your your self therapy session and, and uh, <laughs> this this definitely sounds from your words like a like a more intense record. Like mm. how what is the the overall look and kind of the 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 things about this record outside of the music i ask that because <clears throat> in the silence in the age of apes video like you've got that overalls look and i think it looks so yeah. badass and i wondered if it's I like got it right here actually Hold on. <laughs> no way yeah. <laughs> thing is as i live 
Yeah. What I just you got just gave away the scoop also the fact that when you're doing these kind of webcam things, you don't really yeah. care what pants you're wearing. <laughs> I think I was wearing no, the thing is, as I live in Helsinki, I have to we had to figure out ways of making music videos right now when we can't really travel to see each other. So what you got here? I'm not putting it on right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They already smell. <laughs> of course, the letter is fake for anyone wondering, but it's basically like I said overalls. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm a tall bloke, and uh, <laughs> combines like it's it's clothing like the idea to be clothes that you wear for work, and you know it's something to be used on a farm down in the mines in a machine room. Again, it's trying to touch more on something that is part of you know that is down on earth but at mm. the same time there is this very once it touches your body there is some sense of sexual taboo in it as well and mm. just very very metal let me sh show the codes yeah go for this it man <laughs> <laughs> this the scoop i didn't know we were getting i love it <laughs> we have pictures published of them already but still um uh, because the back side, it was one of those things where all the different ideas that, you know, the instructions that we gave to uh, Michaela Magnusson, who does it, uh, all boiled down to I, work, well, I was in her apartment trying it and putting it on when it was half done. And it's just, it's so damn metal. Yeah. <laughs> it's so very, I, I feel like I should, you know, some kind of biker from a cyberpunk future. I don't know. Uh, so, but again, if we wanted something that, that I, I guess the marriage between doing an album that deals with, again, we're back on earth, we're dealing with dark shit and, and stuff that is very personal and feels very complicated to try to untangle and unpack and uh, just process and it's very aggressive. And you marry that with, again, that avatar is also theater. And that's a very important aspect of what we are and always will be. So it still needs to be um, larger than life, theatrical, whoever, what do you mean less is more, more is more presentation. <laughs> like, so did, like, I, I always love asking this, your influences outside of the world of music when it comes to the visuals. Um, is there anything that's at the forefront of your mind when you think about the look that is coming for Hunter Gatherer when it comes to things outside of music, movies, video games, whatever? Like, it feels like you're beating Cyberpunk 2077, the massive video game that's coming to the punch yeah. with your look. <laughs> Haven't played that yet. Uh, uh, obviously, it's not out yet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's got a while before it's out. I hope it, I hope we it would be convenient if it came out before we were able to tour again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to try to remember now because yeah. it was again an essential. There, there can be a couple of snippets of things like one film we tend to go back to for different reasons throughout the last bunch of years is the old silent movie Metropolis. And there you have those in long, long rows, the factory workers on the mm. clock, uh, Chaplin's modern times. It's actually a lot of silent movie era things that mm. then marriages itself. When you say cyberpunk, for instance, one, one of the insights, I guess, that kind of informed the way the aesthetic and the lyrics, the musical content of this album, how it came together, is the fact that you know, from time to time, I uh, I return to one of my big, most, for me, most significant gateway drugs to extreme music, which was the Manufacturer by Fear Factory, and then that, when you look at that whole era and look at the idea of technology as horror, it suddenly feel like, kind of feel like we live in the world they were warning us about, don't we? Yeah. Are we there now? Isn't Absolutely. This is, thing... this, is, this is a real life Black Mirror episode. Yeah, exactly. The funny thing, funny thing now, yeah. with the, us being a bit hyped for a cyberpunk game is that we kind of, 
are living in that cyberpunk world, you know, and it's uh, just that it's a bit more boring than in the, in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. they they didn't they didn't sell us this in the jetsons did they no no exactly <laughs> and, and and that's because i don't know i'm in a privileged enough position to be you know seated where i am so i can make jokes about it being boring but it's either that or for those who can't be bored by it it's incredibly painful and atrocious mm. you know if you want to paint it all in a black light cool things happen too i uh you know, I'm here at home, not touring, so I see so spring and summer arrive, and I'm looking at a lot of sea life and watching birds, and they had their all they are all the babes have hatched, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, so you don't you don't see you don't see that from the inside of a tour bus. I, I know where you're coming no, from. No, exactly. No, I'm just. So fi final question from me before I let you go. Um, yeah. Like, it feels like a horrible time to be talking about touring, right? But, like, when the world starts turning again and you are on a stage, are you excited about what you've put together for the Hunter Gatherer uh, album cycle? Because, like, there's one thing getting an Avatar record and getting to live with that art, but there's another thing to get to an Avatar show and it be a new a new show. Uh, what's, what's coming? Like, um, what can you tell us without spoiling it? Well, let me put it this, let me put it like this: the, our line, our way of thinking about how to present, how to visualize the music and express it is, if what we did on stage with Avatar Country, and you know, an ongoing theme for for most bands, at least for us, I guess, is that whatever you are putting out right now is a reaction not to what came just before, and. I think what we did on stage with Avatar Country was in a way quite pornographic. It was very much, it was very, you know, in your face. And uh, it, yeah, like pornographic, <laughs> uh, very a throwback to the 80s with elevators and stuff. And the way we are, our way of thinking right now is to be, is to lo look at erotic, I can't pronounce it. That's correct. Eroticism. 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 Yeah. Uh, rather than pornography, which means that you work in more subtle ways. You you trigger, activate more parts of your brain, more parts of your imagination, and draw you in that way. And hopefully, once things get going, it's more real. It hits you deeper and the trip is different like that this is a very abstract way of describing it of course i get yeah. it but you know it's uh, yeah it's it's gonna i want to mess with your brain more i guess a better way of difference would be the difference between uh splatter horror uh brain dead and yeah. then, uh, some kind of psychological horror like uh, like the shining you know gotcha what well, all builds to one X murder. <laughs> like you're going to make the audience feel like voyeurs is what you're saying. Yeah. You know, to that human aspect of it, that uh, feels like a very important part of this album that needs to be there. And that would make it more, you know, closer. Again, the stage outfit in a way, once the coat comes off, it is a bit more, it's not undressed as in any, you know, mm. it wouldn't work in a strip club, but still it brings you, with a poofy shirt and jacket and vests and stuff is still more distance. This is still just yeah. the clothes we wear brings us more skin to skin with the audience, I think. So Ooh. there is that aspect of it. And yeah, again, it's, it's more ero erotic than pornographic, which uh, takes a little bit more, but then will bring you way further and it hits you way deeper. That's the well, ambition. Well, keep your stage outfits for if you ever have to work the strip clubs after Avatar <laughs> is finished. Johannes, it's so nice to finally meet you, mate. Um, nice to meet you too. Uh, when the record is out in early August, come back and we can do a, we can do another chat once I've yeah, heard yeah. the record and we can get inside the art and talk about the ballad and the album itself. Yeah, so, thanks so much for Thank taking you. the time, man.
I have to confess, I've only ever seen Avatar at festivals. And what I will say about them is their fans are turbo dedicated. I love the fact that when Avatar plays somewhere, you get a bunch of the theatrics with the fans as well. People dressing up and really making an event of it. And, you know, a good time to be had. So do check out Avatar. Their new album, Hunter Gatherer, is out at the beginning of August. We might have you had us back on the show once the album's been out and I've heard it and we can get into that a little bit more. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you get this show. Final interview this week comes from um, the front man of one of the best bands to really make an impact in recent years. If you haven't heard Power Trip's Nightmare Logic in the three and a half years since it's been released, I mean, I don't know what rock you would be sat under, but if you haven't heard it, maybe the best guitar tone in contemporary metal riffs that go from suicidal tendencies to Pantera and everything in between, attitude, a lot to say, as you're about to find out. Riley Gale fronts this band. Um, 420 for life. Here's Riley from Power Trip on Mosh Talks with me, Bees. Riley Gale from Power Trip, man. How have you been? What's up, Bees? I've been pretty good. How have you been? Yeah, not so bad. Not so bad. How was lo- I have to ask this to everyone. How's lockdown yeah. been for you? Uh, it's been stressful. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, if 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 we knew if I knew that there was some kind of date or end in sight, I would feel a lot better about it. But, you know, it's it's scary. This is the longest we've ever gone without playing a show. Period you know, since the band began. So it's just one of those things where it's kind of hard to find time to, to do things for myself. It's hard to get motivated to be completely honest. You know, there's only so much you can do. And uh, Dallas has had, you know, city ordinance where masks are required everywhere, which is fine. I back that up. There's no problem with that, but um, you know, with, with the protests going on and, everything else going on it's just it's it's a, i think i think i feel like everybody else just a, a big keeping mass of uncertainty kind of weighing over everybody yeah. um, i don't know if the the ideologies whether you want to say it's two or two and a half or whatever i don't know how these ideologies are going to come together and find a compromise in the situation that we're in sort of, I know it's beyond the quarantine lockdown and things like that. And Texas, a lot of stuff is starting to open back up, which is cool. Um, I'm probably going to take a road trip this weekend and try and see some friends in Austin and San Antonio, just because I've been locked down for so long. But uh, yeah, overall, you know, I think, I I think it's just, everyone just feels uncertain, you know? Yeah. And, and when, when things kick back up again, it's like, do we try and fight to get back, be one of the first bands back out on the road? Do we sit back and wait and see what the economy looks like? Because I feel like the music economy is in a big danger of, of, um, you know, a lot of bands are going to be taking steps back. I feel like, you know, venues are probably going to be charging more for tickets. There's probably going to be, merch cuts and bigger merch cuts and if a venue didn't do a merch cut they'll probably start doing a merch cut and bands will probably have to take lower guarantees there's just a whole mess of things that um yeah it's it's so uncertain for an already uncertain industry when you're trying to make a career out of it so um could i Sure. Can I ask Riley, like, how much strain does this put on the a, a band the size of Power Trip, right? Because because when we saw, like, I've got mate, I've got loads, you know, man, I've got loads of mates in bands, and I've heard stories, but like, like when it comes to Power Trip, I don't mean to start this off on a bit of a bummer, but like, 
Like, how much strain has this whole situation put on a band in your position? I think it's put uh, quite a bit of strain on our position because, you know, we don't really know what to do with ourselves. Um, I've been trying to be a little more politically active and work with some charities and, and things like that. But, like, you know, uh, I don't really know what – most of the other guys are up to uh, from day to day. I know Nick and Chris have taken up fishing. Um, Olsh is out in Philadelphia, so I don't really know what he's 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 up to. Um, and 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 Blake's writing; he's working. But you know, right now it's kind of like, what's the point of recording an album when we don't know when we can tour off of it or get any real support from it? You know? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I admire the bands that are, are being bold enough to drop records right now, but you know, it doesn't, you know, I think Lamb of God is like the biggest band I've seen to drop a record and, mm. uh, you know, they'll be fine. They're a legacy band. So they, they can kind of do that. But for us, I think the third record is going to be a huge matter of, of timing and, and, yeah, I don't know. We, we we went from, you know, trying to write and be in the studio by August to now we're kind of just like in a holding pattern to see what happens with the rest of the world, you know? Mm. Have, you, have you started? So because I was going to ask you this later on, but like it's been like three plus years since you did Nightmare Logic with Arthur Rizik. Like um, how far uh, is are you written? For a new record, are you, well, are you like Blake, done and ready Blake's to record? Always, or? Blake's always writing. He's got, he's got, I mean, probably gigabytes now of just riffs that he records, <laughs> and he's even gotten into a pattern of, uh, uh, um, he's got like a little drum machine that he'll program some rough song ideas so that when him and Chris do get together, there's sort of a map that he's got in place, but. Uh, I've always I, I have a ton of lyrical content written, but most of the time that stuff doesn't come together until I'm in the studio and I hear, you know, the the actual structure of the song and things like that. So mm -hmm. and and where I think, you know, uh, a line works or a subject matter works here or there, whatever. I, I I don't you know, I get inspired to write down one-liners or, or like clever topics or whatever but you know i don't uh really get anything written until i'm i'm in studio so mm. yeah well, i know that there i know that i know that uh uh you know blake's gotten together with with uh chris Ulsh, our drummer and i think he's even uh gotten together with nick which um you know, which would be really cool uh, if uh, if Nick got involved with writing of this record, you know, just to have another perspective. And, and Nick's a great guitar player. So I think, you know, I think he could come up with a, a, a song on his own. I, there was a song on Nightmare Logic. Well, there was a song that went unused for Nightmare Logic that Nick had essentially wrote the entire thing. And we just never got around to recording it. But it, it was a good song. So um you know we're trying to uh step out of the box i guess even more so on this album i don't think you'll see anything too crazy but uh uh yeah i you know um blake's got a lot of ideas in his head and uh uh well we never really you know know what something's going to sound like until we all get together and start tracking so. yeah that's fair enough. Like, I wanted to ask about Nightmare Logic. Like, you taught that for for so for so long because it feels like a real of, of the recent era, a real landmark for heavy music. Like, I tell you, man. Like, when I have a big shuffle playlist, when so when night something from Nightmare Logic comes on, like you get that jolt and real like fuck yeah. Um, was it, did you stay on the road because you knew you had something special with that record? Cause the reaction I mean, to it's been mad. Kind of, kind of, yeah. kind of know. Like we were, we were going to take time off to keep working on the record. And then it was like Danzig asked us the tour and it was like, well, fuck, you don't say no to Danzig. And then it yeah. was like high on fire asked us to go on tour with devil master and creeping death who are like, not just like, 
those aren't just three bands that I love, but it's like Creeping Death and the Devil Master people are, are great friends too. So it, it, <laughs> we just kept getting these offers that were kind of hard to turn down. And, uh, and, and we're still saying to ourselves, you know, there's a lot of people out there who probably haven't heard these songs or, or you know, mixing up set lists or whatever. Uh, you know, we just went to Asia for the first time back in February. The last show we played was February 17th in Bangkok, Thailand. So, um, yeah, just stuff kept popping up. But now here we are where we've got a lot of time. But, you know, uh, 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 Blake hasn't settled on a studio, I don't think, yet. And there's just kind of like we, we we don't really know it, 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 it it's hard you know yeah. and, and 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 we even did hornet's nest to hold people over and now it's like that's almost two years old that'll yeah. be two years old in like i think october or something but people like that song is getting a lot of play and still getting a lot of love and then you know we said to ourselves well what the hell can we do while everyone's locked down and it's like well you know usually we think live records are kind of corny but at this time where people are are are, are you know uh um <laughs> they're 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 suffering they want live music and they're not getting it you know they're being yeah. deprived of the live music experience and so we found a really great soundboard recording from uh our headlining tour with sheer mag and Red Death and Fury, and our sound guy Zach Rippy just did his thing on mixing and mastering it, and it came out sounding fucking awesome. So we said, let's put it out and let's you know have give people something mm. to so even if it's songs that they've heard, you know, let's give them something to listen to while we're sort of in this holding pattern. That's it, man. And I like. I've got respect for any band trying to do anything in a situation like this, right? But there's something about a live album and hearing your fans fight you for the mic <laughs> and things like that, that like, it was like, oh, that's, it's at least a warm yeah. reminder of what live music is rather than I you, was, you members of Power Trip playing Soul Sacrifice in your bedrooms or whatever. I was skeptical of it at first, you know, because it's like, I think, you know, there's only a couple of live records that I really dig and they're usually like older, kind of like classic rock records or whatever. Which but, ones? Um, uh, Strangers in the Night, the UFO <laughs> live album. Nice. Um, uh, the, the live from Hammersmith, or, or No Sleep Till Hammersmith, Motorhead. Um uh i hate being put on the spot but no are, worries man those are probably two of my yeah favorites. yeah um so uh yeah it, it 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 actually you know yeah you can sort of feel the energy bleed through and you can tell that there's crowd interaction and 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 we didn't set out to make it like a live album like we weren't like all right we're gonna set this up to record it live the venue just so happens to keep all the soundboard recordings and everything's on a channel so you know um our sound guy's a producer and everything so he got to do everything he wanted to to make it sound really good yeah but we still get to got to keep in some of the banter and yeah you get to hear you know some of the, the yeah most of the sing-along parts that's not like Nick or anyone backing me up. It's usually someone with, with the mic, you know, grabbing the mic for me and stuff. And it's awesome. I, I don't know if you've ever been to Numos, but like, that's a great venue. I love it. I thought what was really cool was we dropped, and this was complete coincidence. Um, we dropped the, the live record the same day that Seattle had set up the autonomous zone in Capitol Hill. Oh. I thought that was really cool. You know, just, sort of this you know we're a political band and and i think you know that's the kind of change that i think we need to see in the world is 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 people peacefully taking back you know the streets and the government and 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 being heard and you know i may not agree with everything in their demands or what's going on but what they've done is proven that that change can happen and that uh you know 
that it's kind of like the whole point of Hornet's Nest is that, you know, you keep fucking with the small, the, the small, you know, th there's, there's a majority. One person walks up and attacks a hornet's nest. Well, there's a thousand bees. Hey. Uh, <laughs> hornets. There's a thousand hornets, you know, like waiting to pounce. And, and that's sort of what I've seen happen now is people have finally had enough. And it's, it's, yeah, the, you know, I, I said, don't mess with the hornet's nest and, and here we are. We've had the government just poking back, and and the people have had enough. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to give you a ton of shit to write about, right? Oh, it is. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, I've got a lot, a lot of lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm realizing it's it's more important to uh, focus on the bigger picture than you know necessarily uh, targeting an individual like. I know I was kind of like picking on the guy from Traps for a while, and I kind of realized that I wasn't going to get through to this guy. He he was set in his ways, and and it it wasn't worth it. It's not worth it to try and um, change some people's minds if I can deliver a broader message that addresses the bigger picture and you know makes for a better world, which is mm. what I've done lyrically in the past and want to continue to do but as we get bigger it does make me question my platform and how to use it and uh uh you know um uh how to be charitable and 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 finding out you know um you know a lot of people have told me it's important for you to look out for number one but uh right now i don't really see it that way i think uh you know whatever happens to me i have I have a good family system and I have a good support system, but a lot of people out there don't. And, uh, and those are the people that need help. You know, that's why we have these bail funds and which we've donated to. And, um, before, uh, uh, you know, the George Floyd thing happened, we, I, I had even gotten up to about $5,000 in donating to Dallas hope charities, which is a, uh, outreach, outreach group. They're the only out, outreach homeless shelter for LGBTQ, and uh, they primarily focus on uh, uh, people of color and people with HIV and AIDS and uh, trans people. Um, and because the numbers of, of of rape and sexual assault and stuff are just astronomical, it's like it's disgusting and. Uh, so that's sort of been my focus is trying to help uh, uh, that marginalized group of people. But now, you know, it's important now for everyone, I think, to realize that uh, uh, it's time to address, you know, Black Lives Matter is the, is, 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 is the song that we need to be singing right now. Everyone does. And what I hope to see is to tie in those things. You know, like, all right, we we're starting to make things better for black and brown people. And now let's start looking at other marginalized groups and figuring out how we can help them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, as, as, you know, the band gets bigger, I, I want to use, I want to be able to, to help people and to use that platform, you know, um, <clears throat> anytime I've called someone out or, try to bring attention to something. It's not because I want the focus on me. I don't care if I have five followers or 50,000 followers yeah. on the internet, but like if I can, you know, get a message that I believe in across to one person, then I, I feel like I've done a good job. Mm. And, and we've touched, I feel like the band is, has, has touched a lot of people in that respect, you know, uh, uh, um, we even had, I got plenty of messages from people who were like, man, I used to like Trapped and I've been seeing what that guy's been posting and I checked out your band and like, I will be at the next show when all of this ends, you know, like we're the, the video with ice T, you know, that's helped bring us a lot of attention. And, you know, uh, ice has become a straight up hero of mine. He really, really gets it. And he really, and, and it's not just about 
black people. It's about all people. He respects everyone um, equally. And I think that, uh, I, you know, I, I, I kind of wish, uh, you know, he would get more into the political sphere because I think he could do a lot of good. And he talks, he could be like the counter to Trump where he talks to people and he talks to them at their level. He's not talking down to you. He's talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and he's an incredibly intelligent person. So I've been learning a lot from him on, on how to sort of navigate this world when you have a political platform that large, because people love calling him out about being, you know, anti-cop, but playing a detective on TV, but they're missing the point that what this is about is about street cops, everyday cops, and the things that they're responding to and the amount of responsibilities that they have. And, and they have too much responsibility. And, and there's, if people would just think outside the box of, 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 of non-lethal responses and being responsive, before something happens, it's really the problem with the police is that they're reactive rather than prevented it. You know, mm. it's like they're, they're not preventing crimes from happening. They're showing up after they've happened. And I'm not saying that we get rid of detectives. There, there will be rapists and there will be murderers and, and we're not going to make everyone in the world perfect. But like, um, you know, I think, I think that's a nuance that's pretty easy to grasp is that we don't need a guy who only has to spend a thousand hours in training, which may sound like a lot to some people, but really isn't. Uh, and then give them a gun and a taser and a badge and basically a license to kill. And now I think the rest of the world is sort of waking up to that. Mm. Um, and hopefully it you know, results in some actual reform this started with us talking about your platform and i think what this chat has shown us is that your the, the size of your platform is not going to impact how hard and fist first you're going to go with what you have to say yeah I, I you know metal is still a small community relatively worldwide but i mean shit you know if if I'm trying to think of an example, you know, Post Malone really likes the band. If if I could sit down with Post Malone and and talk to him and be like, dude, you're the biggest pop star in the world. Like, you should be out here trying to help and change the world. You know, I think if he sat and listened to me, then maybe, you know, he has the power to do more than I do. Mm. Um, and 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 I. Uh, you know, it, it, it has a ripple effect. I, I think it does. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I, I, I agree with you that like, I wish I could, you know, just give a knockout blow to the government that we've got going right now. I wish we could give a knockout blow to pretty much every government in the world. And, uh, you know, I think very abstractly, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't think borders are really necessary. I don't think guns are necessary. I don't think, you know, I, look, I understand the reasoning and, and the arguments behind it all. And, and I respect them, but, you know, I have, I live in a, I have a very abstract and loving view of the world and, and that, that is that every human life is of equal value. Um, you know, Trump's life is, is worth just, and my life are worth just the same as, you know, the child starving in Africa. But that child that's starving is dying. And I don't have the power to save that child. But I can tell you Donald Trump fucking does. And he's not doing anything about it. And there's stuff like that going on all over the world. And there's plenty of people that are guilty. And clearly I'm keeping this focused on America because it's where I'm from and it's what I know. It's what I know best. 
Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, to get back to that, uh, right now is the perfect time to learn. Like, turn off your fucking TV and read. Read, read some textbooks. Take an online course. There's a lot of colleges offering online courses. I believe Harvard is offering an intro to philosophy class online that anyone can sign up for, just Philosophy 101. All it's on, all it's on you is to go get the books and read, and you don't even have to. You can just sit back and just listen. And I think, you know, one of the things I've been considering if this is going to extend any longer is going back to school and try and become more educated or maybe try and become more politically active. Um, I'm joining uh, a charity coalition uh, that I mentioned earlier with Dallas Hope Charities. And the whole point is to have sort of people that are influential, maybe they're not majorly influential. Like I, I don't consider myself a major influence, but, uh, uh the director, uh, Evie believes that, you know, uh, my voice can help. And I said, I'll, yeah, I'll sign me up. I'll do, I'll do what I can and just let me know what you need. So, um, uh, that's still being established, but, uh, you know, maybe you'll see something like that. Uh, uh, I know, uh, our art director is working on um, a charity t-shirt right now. And, you know, we've been trying to do things here and there. Um, mm. Or I've been trying to do things here and there to help. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard when you're locked down. It's hard when you've got, you know, other responsibilities to take care of. My landlord ain't giving me any breaks on rent or anything like that. So, yeah, it's been a lot of it's been a lot of hustling and trying to figure out, you know, um, shit. I even called Home Depot the other day asking if that, if they had, you know, jo- I've been calling around and asking for job availability. I'm not below working at a grocery store and stocking vegetables or or whatever. But the the the, the media is lying. At least here, the, the, there's not really a lot of work out here. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's kind of just sitting around and waiting for unemployment to come in and maybe sell some, I've been selling some comic books and some shirts and just things like that. But, you know, Riley, as fans, what can we do to support power trip? What's the best ways that we can support power trip right now? I mean, the best way you can support power trip is just to listen to the shit out of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and maybe buy, you know, maybe buy the MP3s. You know, uh, uh, there's there's a donation button on Spotify that 100% goes to us. Um, pay attention to those days when Bandcamp offers 100% of the revenue going to the bands. Um, you go to our Bandcamp. Uh, there's, uh, you know, web stores. Uh, we've got a web store with cold cuts for the U.S. We've got evil greed for Europe. We're working on setting up some web stores for Australia and Southeast Asia and stuff. So we can kind of, uh, save people money on shipping and things like that and still see some money. So, you know, we're not trying to be too in your face about it. Uh, I don't want to be in your face about it. There's people that are struggling way harder than we are. Um, but yeah, if you care, just, spend money I yeah. to say that i hate saying that but mm. yeah um just if when you can you know uh, uh and we're constantly swapping out uh designs and stuff like that so like you know there's there's uh always gonna be fresh power trip gear for people to buy if they want it um like I said, buying the MP3s as opposed to just streaming on Spotify always helps. But you know, if you've given that album a ton of hours on on Spotify, maybe consider um, throwing a couple bucks through the donation button. Um, uh, yeah. But you know, right now, I, I, that that stuff is in the back of my mind. You know, I want I, I we need the help, of course. Every band does. But uh, there's much bigger fish to fry out there right now than 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 making sure I will survive. Yeah, I will be okay. 
Oh, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to, you know, go broke and say, hey, I got to move back in with my parents until some of this shit blows over. Yeah. So, and, well, and it, it's, it's okay. Uh, hmm. uh, so, you know, um, I'm not telling people to do anything. But if they if they do care, just yeah, just listen to it. Just yeah, we've got I, that I, new record out, and uh, we should have some new merch dropping. Uh, hopefully, a vinyl version of the live record comes out. Um, yeah. So, so just a final question to just finish up, right? Like, yeah. you got a good era going on right now of heavy music. Like yeah. uh, when I look at the bands that have broken in the last three or four years who have just kind of had their breakout success, bands like yourselves, Vane, Code Orange, there's a band on the way called Slow Bleed that are so sick out of California. Do they have you, anything out? Uh, they've got an EP out. Uh, like I'll, I'll, DM, I'll, I'll text it to you afterwards. Cool. Like the... This era of heavy music, does it feel like you're part of something special? Because all these bands are different to one another, but oh, yeah. everyone's bringing something that's super exciting at the minute to the world of heavy music. Yeah, I really do. I think, I think, uh, and a lot of them are our friends. It's like Code Orange, Turnstile, Vane. All those bands you've mentioned are, are people that I know and have hung out with or toured with. And, and like, I'm so proud of everything that they do. Uh, whether, you know, I, it's my style of music or not. Uh, but like, uh, I do feel like the creativity of heavy music is sort of coming back the way it was in the nineties, sort of where people were willing to take risks and, and actually execute it successfully, you know? Um, uh, and, and I think that's something that, yeah, I think, you know, for so long in the 2000s, it was like people discovered programming music and, and, and digital recordings and all this stuff that, you know, rap and a lot of like really overproduced stuff took over the airwaves, trapped being a perfect example of like not what a good representation of heavy music is. So, yeah, I, you know, do I see any of our bands being on the radio? Not really, but I don't think we really need the radio anymore. Mm. Uh, but it's been cool. Last night, you know, the local metal station played. They have, like, a local two-hour show, and they played two songs off the live record. They've played our stuff before, so, you know, they, they're supportive. Uh, but, yeah, I think you're dead on. I think people, you know – you look at a lot of rappers and how they dress like rockers. They want to be punk rockers. You know, you've seen who's the guy who did, uh, uh, what did he do? Did he do a rage against the machine song or like a oh, Den Denzel Curry, Denzel Curry. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was really cool. Like I thought he did a really great job on that, you know? And, and, um, I would love to get a room, into a room with those guys and some musicians and be like, look, let me show you how to write a fucking metal song, you know, and, and we'll come up with some really cool lyrics and you can still be you. And yeah, uh, uh, that's something that I think um, uh, those boundaries are being broken down constantly, you know, uh, 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 with, with, pop stars wanting to get in wanting to have that rock and that metal aspect sort of but the sound doesn't really back it up so i don't know i you know um we did a few shows with volby and i thought uh we were too heavy for half the crowd so maybe most the mainstream world isn't really ready for bands like us or or code orange or or whatever but um you know the more pissed off the world gets, I don't see them going to, you know, Adele for yeah. their, to satisfy their musical uh, 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 needs, you know. The, yeah, I hear the, you. I don't, I don't fancy listening to Camila Cabello at the moment. It's not my vibe. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I've been listening to just like a lot of like new wave and a lot of old eighties music, a lot of, Sisters of Mercy and and New Order and then like even just like 
Bananarama and like Switchblade Sisters and the Strawberry Switchblade and all this other shit. And it's just, I don't know. I guess it's because, you know what I do? I'll, I'll say this. I have been jamming the hell out of that Body Count album. I think not just because I'm on it. I skip my track, but <laughs> I think the rest of that album is legitimately really, really, really good. I think it's the best Body Count album, period. That, that he's done. I think it's the best work that he's done. And the last one was sick as well. Both the Ooh, last yeah. two body count records have slammed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I mean, this, I think Carnivore is really, really taking it to another level. And like, I don't know if you saw the Bum Rush video, but they did that like four months, four or five months ago, like before the quarantine hit. And it, it's like on some crystal ball type of shit, you know? Like <laughs> the whole video is just like, uh, riot footage and them taking over the airwaves and kind of like sort of it, it reminded me of all the the people in Seattle taking over Capitol Hill and stuff like that and I just I don't know T, T is T T is it, he sees the world and he sees the big picture and I admire and respect the fuck out of him for that. So I met I met on that. That's one new that's one new album that I'm impressed with and and. Uh, I think I think Code Orange really did do something special on their last album. Um, you know, they know that that their style isn't something that I'm super into, but I've jammed that record uh, a few times because uh, I'm just like, what the fuck are they doing right now? Like, what's going on with this production? This is insane. So I think that they really hit a big uh, milestone with uh with what is with underneath because um i think they i think it's something that they've been building to and they finally nail like knowing them as friends i think that they finally nailed what they've been going for for a long time mm. so um all, you know, all, of, um, all of that and now i've got the thought of power trip and denzel curry doing some kind of anthrax and public enemy deal like Riley, chase that down, my friend. Well, I mean, even someone sent me a video of Post Malone and this rapper Puya talking about wanting to make music with us, and I'm like, I'm here, I'm down. <laughs> I have nothing better to do. Y'all are rich. Buy my ass out. We'll write, we'll write whatever you know. Like, <laughs> I'll sleep on your couch in your mansion. You know, like, I, I yeah, it's, it's, it's. It's been cool getting attention. For, I, I, I don't know that Denzel knows who we are, but, but um, uh, you know, we've been doing the, the Evil Beat series of shows, the kind of hometown shows. We've only done two. But we asked Denzel Curry to, to, to do one, you know, when we did the show back in January, and I think he was on his own tour. But, yeah, we're, we're, we're also, you know, from that sort of – rap and, and pop end of things where they're embracing um rock and roll where i'm trying to get to a level where we're meeting them halfway on the other side too it's like yeah man you want to make a fucking song with our band come on like let's do it <laughs> you don't have to hire these random guns to play a cover with you like 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 write some real shit and and put it out there and yeah let's let's do this thing for real so it's a wonderful thought, Riley. Cheers for checking in, man. Look after yeah. yourself, and I will see you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me anytime, and it's always a pleasure. You are one of the best interviewers in the game, uh, so mad respect to you, Bees. Uh, love the Exorcist shirt. <laughs> More record. Got the Guns N' Roses box. <laughs> Next time you're in L.A., you'll have to come round, man. <laughs> yeah, you better get, let me come check out the pad. Uh, Absolutely, mate. Episode. See you soon. Okay, great. Thanks for having me, dude. See you later, mate. Yeah. Okay, thank you to Riley Gale from Power Trip for being with us. Check out their live album from Seattle now. Link in the description below. That is it. For Mosh Talks this week's, so make sure you are subscribed on the NotFest YouTube channel so that you never miss us. We're back every single Tuesday with five interviews from the worlds of rock and metal and punk and hardcore, everything in between. If there is someone that you want to see on this show, comment section, use it. We are always listening to you. So if you want to see someone on this show, let us know. We'll try and make it happen. Uh, I can't tell you who's on the show next week, but I can tell you 
you already know there's going to be bumper guests. See you next Tuesday. Thank you to Jacoby Shaddix from Papa Roach, to Jesse Leach from Killswitch and Times of Grace and all those other bands he told me about, uh, to Mick Gordon, composer of Doob Eternal, to Riley Gale from Power Trip, to Johannes Eckerstrom from Avatar. I'm out and I'll see you next week for more Mosh Talks with Bees or... You might be seeing me a little bit sooner than that. Couldn't possibly tell you anything about it, though. See you soon. <laughs>